This week on the video version of the business of tech, Kasey didn't pay for the decryption, but what about those NDAs? The semiconductor shortage, business travel, virtual doctors, and the pandemic, a look at the market. Government security movements, stats on the landscape, and other side smarts. How many in SMB are innovative? Google and Microsoft, a tale of two support perceptions. Earnings season and the tea leaves, plus broadband, the impact to work, and the new CDC guidelines changing reopening plans. All this and more, hit that like and subscribe button, and here are this week's stories. Let's kick off our week with some review of the current state of play. Reuters is reporting that the semiconductor shortage could last well into 2020 and that smartphone production may be next to be impacted. Intel revealed a timeline in their earnings call expecting shortages to bottom out in the second half of this year and one to two years to catch up with the demand. Of course, the company also reported record revenues for the quarter ending June 30th, with its PC business sales up 33% year over year. How about business travel? The airlines are reporting that while it's recovering, the levels are half of what they were in 2019. They anticipate the reopening dates of September and October as key. Of note, sales and consulting travel is up. Fares are similar to pre-pandemic levels, and there will be a four- to six-week lag between business travel and reopenings. And it's unknown how hybrid work will impact travel. Here's one trend to track, too. Nearly one quarter of Americans have had a virtual doctor appointment in the last month. That's down one percentage point since the question was started in April. Another stat, it's 21% of doctors' visits in April 2021 that are virtual, compared with 69% of visits in April 2020. One reason? Patients are returning for care that was pushed off because of the pandemic, per earnings reports from hospital operators. And the larger context here, the ongoing pandemic. The daily average of confirmed cases in the U.S. has about quadrupled during July, and new projections say this will accelerate through the summer and fall with a peak in mid-October attributed to the more aggressive Delta variant. Now, why do we care? I'll do more world of work tomorrow, too, but the COVID context matters to start with. This is going to change the state of the market over the rest of the year. It's not over yet, folks. The market is not what it was, and it won't be what it was. The chip shortage is going to be a constant, and as that drives a lot of technology spending, my recommendation is to be working with customers earlier on their plans. It's going to take a lot longer to get new gear than you might expect. The data on virtual doctor's visits parallels a lot of work experiences. Telemedicine is a thing, and it's not taking over, and it's not disappearing. Behavior will settle in differently, and just like the chip shortage, a catch-up period for businesses is to be expected. Savvy operators will find their own customer's backlog and expect that what's happening now isn't a final state. Layer in the pandemic, and you have a dynamic, unstable market. Let's highlight the work of No More Ransom, which turns five years old today. The project has helped over six million ransomware victims and saved almost one billion euros in payments. It's a public-private partnership between law enforcement and industry leaders. The project helps recover encrypted files, raise awareness of threats, and provide direct links to report attacks. And speaking of decryptors, Kaseya has obtained the universal decryptor from a third party, and cannot confirm nor deny any ransom payment was made. The tool has been confirmed to be effective by third parties. Why do we care? I'll make my case for disclosure notification right here. The first story is a collaboration that helps users. The second leaves too many unanswered questions. Did Kaseya pay off the ransom? Apparently we won't know. An uncertainty that I find uncomfortable. Two questions providers should ask. The first... How are executives' compensation tied to security? And second, what are their policies regarding security vulnerabilities? This move by Kaseya shouldn't be surprising, as their policies are not researcher nor disclosure friendly. 
two questions to ask your vendors. Let's do another World of Work segment. In data from the Department of Labor announced last week, Americans saved 26 minutes on average traveling from 2019 to 2020. That's from the American Time Use Survey, and that adds up to 6.5 days saved over the course of a year. Where did that time go? Household activities, sports, and leisure. Twitter announced they will be embracing asynchronous work, while DoorDash will transition to a hybrid model in January. 80% of its workforce is expected in the office a few days a week. Etsy also announced an investment in hybrid work, although without a timeline. Even game development is done differently. Electronic Arts is profiled in a Verge article stating clearly, quote, I don't think we will ever go back to how we were before the pandemic. That said, some companies are worried about pushback on returning to the office. LaSalle Network's second office re-entry index, taken in May, says 74% believe they will be back in the office by fall, and the emphasis is less on a phased approach than the previous index. That leads to an increase in expectation of pushback, up 5 percentage points to 39% expecting that conflict compared to March's sample set. Now, where will that happen? Well, despite speculation of a city exodus, a Brookings analysis of U.S. Postal Service addresses showed that cities like New York, San Francisco, and L.A. are coming back strong. The moves happened within metro areas, not across them. Of course, office vacancies are also very high, hitting all-time highs of over 20% in New York and San Francisco. The good news? Employees may be feeling better about it all. Per a survey by Protocol Workplace, 88% of tech industry workers feel appreciated by their employers, and 87% believe they have good work-life balance. 89% say that at least somewhat, companies have figured out how to make remote and hybrid meetings work well. Now, before we celebrate too much, this is a 64% male survey, and 79% with bachelor's degrees. And in the data, women are less likely to see opportunities for career advancement. How about those incentives to lure workers to small towns? Turns out, it's not going well. Per long-form reporting in The Atlantic, those programs are not working particularly well. Incentives range from $3,000 to $20,000, and the totals of those that have moved are not impressive. And, like yesterday, context for the return to work. ABC News is reporting on local health departments taking the lead on returning mask mandates for all residents. And the Washington Post is reporting on bars in San Francisco requiring proof of vaccination for entry to protect workers. This, as the CDC is considering changes to their guidance. Now, why do we care? I'm layering back in COVID coverage to give some context. Doesn't make sense to me to talk about the changes in dynamics of work without acknowledging that there will be factors related to the pandemic. Thus, we're considering two timeframes, during the pandemic and post-pandemic, as it's quite clear we aren't actually post-pandemic now. To the data, employees got back time they lost in commuting and put that to quality of life, and many men are feeling much better about work. Previous data tells us the impact on women has been harder during the pandemic, and we add to that now. There doesn't appear to be a mass exodus from cities, and programs to lure to smaller ones don't appear to be working. Large physical concentrations of humans are still the pools to pull employees from, although they can work for companies anywhere. So, revisiting Kaseya. Updating on yesterday, the company strongly denied paying to get access to the Universal Decryptor. While each company must make its own decision on whether to pay the ransom, Kaseya decided after consultation with experts to not negotiate with the criminals who perpetrated this attack, and we have not wavered from that commitment. That from a statement released Monday. As such, we are confirming in no uncertain terms that Kaseya did not pay a ransom, either directly or indirectly through a third party, to obtain the decryptor, end quote. 
CNN additionally confirmed that Kaseya required a non-disclosure agreement to gain access to the decryptor, and Kaseya told ZDNet they were unable to comment on the agreement. Cybersecurity experts noted that asking for an NDA was not an everyday practice, and also that it could be to ensure that the third party who provided the key is not disclosed, nor the manner in which the decryption is made available. Now, why do we care? It's the NDA that's been causing a lot of agitation in the IT provider community. Let's discuss. It's easy to push back on this with a cynic's eye. Sure, they don't want customers talking about it. That said, protecting methods and sources is important. Here's the two-part takeaway. First, I hope providers are learning lessons about what to ask about disclosure and security policy before the inevitable breach. This is stuff you need to establish before you need it, not after. Second, NDAs are negotiable. Like any contracts, they can be negotiated. Define what information is to be protected. You don't have to sign one. If it smells like extortion, it might be extortion, and you have other options. After all, you are the customer. IT providers too often forget that. Brazil has created a cyber attack response network aimed at promoting faster response to cyber threats and vulnerabilities through coordination between federal government bodies. Created through a presidential decree signed on July 16th, the Federal Cyber Incident Management Network will encompass the Institutional Security Office of the Presidency, as well as all bodies and entities under the Federal Governing Administration. Public companies, mixed capital companies, and their subsidiaries may become members of the network voluntarily. President Biden has sent a warning in an address to the U.S. intelligence community. Quote, I can't guarantee this, and you're as informed as I am, but I think it's more likely we're going to end up, well, if we end up in a war, a real shooting war with a major power, it's going to be as a consequence of a cyber breach of great consequence. And it's increasing exponentially, the capabilities, he said. In hearings on Capitol Hill on Tuesday, the Justice Department, FBI, Secret Service, and CISA all stated Congress should consider passing a bill forcing companies that have been hit by a cyber attack to report it. The FBI also weighed in that ransomware payments should not be banned, as it might lead to further extortion efforts. In those hearings, lawmakers focused on how small companies are taking the brunt of the damage without the deep pockets of large companies to absorb the breach. Google has a new bug bounty program. The new site brings together all of their vulnerability rewards programs into a single intake form and includes gamification features and options for interaction and competition. There's also an education program called Bug Hunter University. That said, data from the latest AppSec stats flash says that the remediation date for severe vulnerabilities is on the decline, while the average time to fix is on the rise. The time to fix vulnerabilities has dropped three days, from 205 days to 202. The average time to fix is 202 days, the report found, representing an increase from 197 days at the beginning of the year. The average time to fix for high vulnerabilities grew from 194 days at the beginning of the year to 246 days at the end of June. Remediation rates have also decreased across all vulnerability severities, with rates for critical vulnerabilities falling from 54% at the beginning of the year to 48% at the end of June. Rates for high vulnerabilities decreased from 50% at the beginning of the year to 38% at the end of June. Of note, Many of these are considered pedestrian and are easy to fix. Security teams report directly to the CISO in half 48% of organizations, whereas 25% report to the CIO, followed by 12% that report to the CEO, according to the ISACA survey, State of Cybersecurity 2021, Part 2. The differences lie in how other executives view cyber risk assessments and the board's prioritization of cybersecurity. The majority of organizations, 76%, perform risk assessments to ensure their regulatory compliance, followed by data prevention loss at 54% and improved communication of security policies and procedures at 51%. 
and HP reports email is still the most popular way for malware to be delivered. It's 75% of all threats. On the other side, malware developers are increasingly using unusual or exotic programming languages in an effort to hamper analysis. From a new report on Monday, there's an escalation of the use of Go, D, Nim, and Rust, which are being used to evade detection or address specific problems in the development process. There's also new Mac OS malware, available for as low as $49 on the dark web. Why do we care? Feels like it's something of a foregone conclusion that breach notifications are coming. There's a marketing angle to this too. The oldest lessons on mistakes is that you over-communicate and over-correct. So with being breached inevitable and disclosure inevitable and all evidence suggesting there's no actual long-term reputational damage due to breach, savvy providers are going to be preparing themselves and their customers for the when of breach from both a technology perspective and a communications perspective. Clear public announcement, coordination with law enforcement, and organized remediation plans that are built before the breach. This isn't to promote lowering your guard or not emphasizing prevention. It just seems that all the prevention discussions ignore the obvious statement. In the current landscape, you're going to be breached. So having that plan is just as important as the prevention plan. Want to ask, why do we care? T-shirts. Stickers. Water bottles. And even aprons. Pick up some of our great stuff at the link in the description below and support the show directly. New CDC guidance released this week issuing recommendations that people who are vaccinated should wear masks in public indoor settings in areas with high rates of disease. Google has announced in a letter to employees that they will be requiring vaccination in order to return to the company's offices. The company is also delaying its official return to the office from sometime in September to October 18th. This joins Apple, who has also delayed and indicated they will now require masks from customers and staff in most of its U.S. stores. Facebook has also indicated that vaccination will be required for any return to the office. Netflix is imposing a requirement that casts and some crew be vaccinated for productions in the U.S. Cisco has announced a hybrid work plan that has no mandates for how often employees go into the office. Twitter is closing its San Francisco and New York offices and putting all other reopening plans on hold. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has said employers can require employees to get a COVID-19 vaccine or bar them from the office. These announcements join companies like Adobe, VMware, Twilio, and Asana, who had previously announced similar policies. According to LaSalle Network's first office re-entry index published in March, 52% of respondents were not planning to mandate employee vaccinations, and this number increased to 69% in the second index published earlier this month. In an article in MIT Technology Review, the best incentive to get the vaccine for those who have not is paid time off. It's not a single solution, but particularly for hourly workers, where only about 50% have received paid time off to get or recover from the shot, it matters. Workers in that group were more likely to be vaccinated. According to a poll published earlier this year, 27% of remote workers with dependents said they would need a minimum of one to three months notice to, quote, be able to go back into the office. A poll from Glassdoor indicates eagerness to return to the office had already started dropping in July when compared to April, down to 66% of respondents from 72%. Now, why do we care? In a landscape where labor is in demand and has control, it may seem counterintuitive to impose a vaccine requirement. I disagree. There's a competitive advantage here. Offer support benefits for time off, including handling any recovery time, and create a supportive culture that includes creating that safe environment to work in. As of this recording, 56.9% of the U.S. population had received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's a majority. Leaders on both sides of the aisle are speaking out now in favor of it. Addressing this pushes us closer to a fully open economy. Go where the puck is going. 
and that's vaccination. Almost one in five employees have been unable to complete work tasks due to poor internet connections, according to AppNeta's Future of the Internet Outlook report released Tuesday, and the company surveyed 1,000 U.S. adults. Poor or limited bandwidth has affected 17% of respondents. As a response, one in five adults have upgraded their at-home internet packages, and 38% feel their employers should pay for an internet connection used for work. Half of respondents, 49%, say the biggest connectivity problems they faced were slow loading times for websites, followed by video calls and services outages. This all from CIO Dive. And on Wednesday, the Senate reached an apparent deal on infrastructure, which includes $65 billion for broadband, intended to ensure every American has access to high-speed internet. This is a lower number than the $100 billion initially set as a goal. The package also includes language from the Digital Equity Act that would create a permanent program to subsidize the cost of broadband for low-income families. Pricing transparency has also been included in the package. And 45% of teleworkers work from a couch, 38% from bed, 20% often work outside. This from a study by home improvement marketing firm Craftjack. Why? Cost. Building a home office is a luxury and many cannot afford it. Now, why do we care? Tie this to our previous story. An observation, if labor is tough to find, building a support system that includes potential subsidies for home environments is another of those competitive advantages to latch on to. The data again shows it's not a huge investment. That can include the broadband and include the home support environment. <laughs> Running through the earnings reports this week. For tech, the news is big and good. Here's the highlights. Apple focuses on services with an all-time high of revenue in the June quarter. The company also warned the chip shortage could be a significant problem going forward. Finally, the company also indicated that the coronavirus will continue to be a challenge for the company and the market ongoing, stating, quote, the road to recovery will be a winding one. Microsoft slowed slightly in growth in Azure from 46% last quarter to 45% this, although their revenues grew. The company also reported slowdown due to the chip shortages impacting Windows OEM revenue and Surface revenues. Cloud and office services are signs of strength for the company, and the company projects further growth in Azure to come. Google narrowed its losses on Google Cloud amid growth of its three lines of ad businesses. Samsung has announced its best operating profit in nearly three years and indicated that market conditions have improved in the memory market. ServiceNow had a better-than-expected second quarter and highlighted strong interest in retooling workflows in companies as a driver. Now, why do we care? Besides Equip that tech companies are making all the money, we can read the tea leaves here. There's a concern about the state of the coronavirus and the chip shortage. Cloud is a massive driver for growth, as is the toolkits focused on improving work. And technology is still very much in demand. <laughs> Google, known for their reputation of killing off products, is working to change that perception. Quoting Protocol, Starting Monday, Google will designate a subset of APIs across the company as Google Enterprise APIs, including APIs from Google Cloud, Google Workplace, and Google Maps. APIs selected for this category, which will include a majority of Google Cloud APIs, according to Kripa Krishan, Vice President of Google Cloud, will be subject to strict guidelines regarding any changes that could affect customer software built around those APIs. The announcement is clear recognition of widespread feedback from Google Cloud customers and outright derision in several corners of the internet regarding Google's historic reputation for ending support for its APIs without sufficient notice or foresight. Three principles quoting ZDNet. First, the enterprise APIs are governed by the principle that no feature may be removed or changed in a way that is not backwards compatible for as long as customers are actively using it. Second, customers will receive a minimum of one year's notice of an impending change. Lastly, any change Google introduces to an API will be reviewed by a centralized board of product and engineering leads 
and will follow a rigorous product lifecycle evaluation. And this week, Microsoft has announced a new support plan for Windows Server. The company is dropping its Windows Server semi-annual channel in favor of a model with only long-term servicing channel releases of the operating system. This will include 10 years of support with five mainstream and five extended. Earlier this year, Microsoft made a change in the servicing plans for Windows 10 Enterprise LTSC and Office LTSC, making support five years total for these products rather than 10. Azure is an exception. There will still be SAC releases on Azure Stack HCI. Now, why do we care? Actions over time are what generate a reputation, and Google certainly earned theirs. The website killedbygoogle.com is your evidence. Microsoft is the other end of the spectrum. They're well known for declaring the entire life cycle of their products as they're released, and thus have a reputation for dependability. Making promises up front and sticking to them is how you build a reputation for reliability. If that's your goal, here's my insight here. It's also notable for Google partners that are now documented promises to hold them to. Tech Isle has some data around technology adoption in SMB. 30% of SMBs have a very innovative mindset and are investing in edge technologies that drive innovation. 51% are in a somewhat innovative segment with a focus on transitioning to being very innovative and are evaluating edge solutions. 38% of SMBs are investing in digital transformation to initiate innovation in product services and business processes. 9.9 .9 is the number of technology categories that very innovative SMBs use which is 1.8 times non-innovative SMBs. Cloud security, virtualization, mobility, AI, analytics, IoT, SD-WAN, AR, VR, HCI are the leading technology areas where very innovative SMBs are increasing investment and deploying edge solutions. Now, why do we care? So a headline, roughly 80% are willing to spend in tech. I've never bought into the idea that SMBs don't spend money on technology, as data like this shows. You have to pick the right customers, but they're generally out there. The difference often has a lot more to do with the advice given than an unwillingness. Next time you hear someone say, my customers won't go for that, is that a lack of selling skill more than an actual understanding of customers? Thanks for tuning in to This Week in the Business of Tech. Shows come out each week, pulling together the daily podcast. If you like this show, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. The content here is possible because of supporters like you. If you want access to shows early, answers to your questions, and private interactions, join our Patreon. It's pay what you want. You decide what the content is worth. Join at patreon.com slash mspradio. Patreons also get access to the written versions of every story as they come out. If you want the stories right away, you can get them on the daily podcast. Find The Business of Tech on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your shows. Subscribe links at businessof.tech, and I'll talk to you again next week.